Um, so now I would like to welcome our speaker, CEO, founder, and principal lawyer of Lex Integra, where she practices exclusively in the areas of business law and corporate ethics. Lex Integra was one of the startup businesses that was actually part of our inaugural uh, ELLA program here. Um, so we're really proud to have her here today. Um, I'd like to welcome Amy. Hi, everyone. Hi, Diana. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I looked through the names quickly. Uh, I didn't see any names that jump, jumped out at me as people that I've worked with in the past or come across. But if you are there, uh, please say hello. Um, and I apologize for the delay. It was my fault. My son broke his arm earlier today. So there's a whole bunch of time at the hospital and running around. And so I wasn't... Uh, my day did not go according to plan, but that's the life of an entrepreneur. So what I wanted to share with you today are uh, basically high level concepts of things that I have seen that impact businesses of all sizes. The difference between an entrepreneurial and a small business versus a big business is that usually, and not always, but usually the bigger business will have more experience and more resources and more uh, people with specialized knowledge in these areas. Whereas as an entrepreneur, you're expected to know everything. And how can you know everything? You can't. And so I have aimed this as a high level conversation. It's possible that many of you will already know a lot of what I'm talking about. And so if in the questions you'd like to go into more detail, uh, we're certainly, uh, we, you know, we can do that. And because I was the one who was late, I'm happy to stay longer if, yeah, if, if you would like that. So it's geared towards people who don't have a lot of background or experience in the concepts that I want to talk about. This is not meant to be exhaustive. There's other business legal issues that we could talk about today that we're not going to. But think of this as a bit of a checklist. Have you thought about all of these things? And if you have not thought about them, why not? Has the time not been right? Or did you not realize that this was something that um, ultimately will, will come to you? So thank you very much uh, to Yspace and to Ella and to City of Markham um, for holding this series. I hope you're able to attend uh, more than one. And uh, we really are talking about legal basics. So not going into a lot of um, detailed concepts. In, and I do have to say, this is a disclaimer, this is not legal advice. If you need legal advice, you should talk to your lawyer or, or find a lawyer. Um, this is just meant to be high level because as you will discover as you work with lawyers, and it'll be this, I'm assuming it's the same with accountants, the advice you get should be unique to your situation. And so event like this can introduce concepts and topics, but of course, without knowing the specific details of your business, um, um, you shouldn't just apply these things without having customized it. Okay, so let's get started. Um, here are the topics that I propose we discuss. Uh, one, as an introduction, I think we always need to start off by talking about leadership and ethics. Um, secondly, I thought we could talk about the corporate side of your business. So people always say, what's the difference between a corporate lawyer and a commercial lawyer, right? The corporate side is setting up your business and it's your business structure. But it's also really important to talk about the commercial side, which is basically the buying and the selling. And this is an area where I have seen that a lot of entrepreneurs um, don't seem to have as much experience or knowledge about. So it's important to me to cover it. And then finally, as a last topic, I wanted to talk about how, how can you best work with lawyers or other professionals in a way that's going to best help you. And I think that sometimes from what I understand, some people say there is a bit of an intimidation factor, or they don't know how the pricing works. And so I think it's worthwhile to spend a little bit of time talking there. Okay, so here we go. Um, as you're setting up your business, there's many things to consider. So as I said, I always like to start off by talking about leadership and ethics 
because as a leader of your business, you are really setting the tone from the top. And whether you're a small business or whether you plan to grow to a big business, you really, in my view, you should be baking in leadership, strong leadership and strong ethics into your business culture right from the start whether that has to do with business practices, whether that has to do with um, how you're doing product development, or whether it just has to do with how you conduct yourself internally with your employees or externally with your customers and suppliers, right? Other things, you know, you'll have on your plate, human resources. Are you going to hire people as employees or are you going to hire them as independent contractors? And what if you mean to hire them as independent contractors? but you don't do it, but you don't conduct yourself or they don't conduct themselves in that way, you could still face liability uh, because they could still be deemed to be employees. And so here are some of the topics. We won't go into all of them. Like we're not going to talk about intellectual property tonight, but that could be one other topic that you could have a whole separate discussion about. So in terms of leadership and ethics, um, I personally don't feel like enough entrepreneurial events or uh, programs talk enough about this. And all you have to do is type in, um, what's her name, Holmes, Elizabeth Holmes, and her trial right now happening in the US. And she is the woman who was behind the face of the CEO behind uh, the company that claimed to have introduced a very cheap and efficient and effective way of taking blood tests at pharmacies. And at one point, this company rose to be valued at a billion dollars before the whole thing came crashing down. And this is massive court case going on asking, did she defraud? Or did the executive team defraud all of the shareholders? So that's a really great example because I find that there's a lot of uh, sexiness when it comes to startups and entrepreneurship and people just kind of see the upside. And I don't find people are spending enough time thinking about how are they setting up their business, right? Are they developing a reputation for good ethics? Are they developing a reputation that um, will make sure that they don't have reputational issues? Are they developing the kind of a business where if one of your employees saw something wrong happening, would they come to you and would they tell you? Or would they just quit because they think, well, this person's not going to do anything about it, right? I once had a, a medium-sized business owner as a client. The business was the client. And within two weeks, they asked me to do something unethical, like to write a letter pretending I was a member of the public to try to find out some information about their, their competition. And I said, not only am I not going to do that, but I, mean, I didn't say it in one sentence. It took a few weeks, but I ended the relationship because that's not the kind of client I want. And that's not the kind of way I do business. And it's important to me that I surround myself with suppliers and customers who are prepared to do business properly and ethically. And this also goes into how you are doing your product development, right? You hear about things like, uh, you know, AI products that by how they're designed, discriminate against women or discriminate against dark skinned people. You know, these, you might say, well, these are not legal issues. Well, you don't want them to become legal issues. And a lot of working with a lawyer and a lot about setting up your, your legal ecosystem is to eliminate or reduce or mitigate risk, right? Like a lawyer is not just somebody you call when you have a problem. You want to design your business, including your products, so that you don't run into problems. And so that's how I think of ethics is that proactive way of setting up your business so that you don't need to to, to call in a bunch of advisors to help you when there's a problem. Okay, so now we get to more like the nuts and bolts kind of stuff. Um, when, when should you organize your business and how should you organize it? So when do you go from somebody who is, uh, you know, giving away things or selling things for a few dollars, like, you know, to somebody who needs to or should incorporate their business? Or do you remain a sole proprietor? 
or are you a partner? Or is your business based on a partnership model? I'm just gonna move over the um, images here, the people. So each kind of each kind of business structure, and that's what we call a partnership or incorporated company or a sole proprietorship, we call those business structures. And each one of them comes with its own risks and liabilities and, and benefits. And so it's up to you to consider what is the best um, and most beneficial business structure for you at this time, right? One year from now, you might say, okay, you know, now is the time I need to incorporate because of these factors that one year ago did not exist. And so these are the kinds of conversations um, it, you would want to discuss with your lawyer, but also with your accountant. And you have to be careful as well about looking at what other people did because their circumstances could be totally different. And I, I can use myself as an example. I've been a lawyer for 20 years, but I only started my own business two years ago after I was laid off. And so in my case, I had a layoff package. And so it wasn't so critical for me to take the revenue out of my business immediately. And so for that reason, and for a few other reasons that were unique to my situation, I incorporated almost immediately. But I know other lawyers who still, after two or three years, have not incorporated and do their business as a sole proprietorship because it makes sense for them from, um, from a tax point of view or for other reasons. So just because your friends or your competition has set up a certain business structure, that doesn't mean that's the right business structure for you. You can always start as one and change later if your circumstances change. So let, let's go a little bit into more detail about what these words mean. Okay, so if you're a sole proprietor, it means that um, you are doing business as you. So if I'm looking at Diana, she's the first person I see on my list of Zoom people, my Zoom uh, photos. So this means if Diana is selling her artwork, she is selling it as Diana. So if she's earning, you know, $20,000 a year working at York, and if she's earning $30,000 a year selling her artwork, at the end of the year, when it comes time to do her taxes, Diana is doing her tax return, and she's adding up the income from both of those uh, things as part of her single entity or, or her tax return, okay? So this is you and your personal capacity. So it affects your income, but from a lawyer's point of view, what's more important than that is it affects your liability. So if her artwork uses some kind of poisonous lead paint and it's put in somebody's home and they're making a claim that the, the fumes from the paint has caused them to be ill and now they've lost time at work because they're too sick to work. Well, Diana's personal assets are at risk because she has not created a separation between herself as a, as a human and the business that is selling the paintings. So the decision to incorporate instead of remaining a sole proprietor, some people make that decision based on the income tax aspect, but that's an incomplete way of thinking about it. You also must think about the liability aspect of it. If you talk to your tax, if you talk to your accountant, they're probably going to focus on the income tax issue. If you're talking to your lawyer, they're probably going to focus on the, the personal liability risk to you. A partnership is, shares many factors uh, with the sole proprietorship. So now instead of one human being running the business and being personally liable for the business, now you've got two people or more. So there's no separate legal entity. Now it's gonna be Diana and Zahida who are running the business together in their personal capacity. So I, um, I write a blog for small Canadian business women. And in, in one of the blogs I wrote about this and I said, 
if let's say if uh, Zahida and Diana create a business where they are making custom furniture, right? Beautiful custom furniture and they sell it to a restaurant and something happens, one of the chairs breaks, a uh, patron of the restaurant falls down, hits their head and now they have migraines you know, for the rest of their life, let's say, and they want to bring a claim against you, against the restaurant, and they're saying that your product was made in a faulty way. Um, again, Zahida and Diana's personal assets are at risk because they have not created a separate legal entity, okay? So I'm not trying to scare you into incorporating. I just want to make sure you understand what the different words mean. Right. If you do enter into a partnership, um, so like I said in this example, let's say um, typically how it can how it works is you're not necessarily responsible 50-50 for the, the damages that person injured person might face. Either one of you could be responsible for hundred percent of those damages. Right. So you really you really want to think about having a partnership agreement that explains who's responsible for what kind of damage and you want to and, and the reason the partnership agreement is valuable and we'll find this later when we talk about a shareholder agreement when we talk about incorporated companies is those agreements tell you how you're going to exit and I tell everybody this all the time agreements are your best friend when things don't when things are not going well right if one of you wants to sell, if one of you wants to exit, is there a calm and logical way that this exit can happen that you planned out before problems started to arise? Okay. And just so you know, so now the next page, we're going to talk about incorporating a company. Now, a corporation can be in a partnership with a human. Um, it's not to say that the partnership always just has to be two or more people. And again, um, all of these topics are meant for you to go back and think about, these are things I should learn more about. These are not meant to make you experts on these topics today. Okay, so what's a corporation? I mean, in Canada, we tend to say corporation in other places like the UK, they might say company. So we tend to say corporation here. So it is a separate legal entity, right? Like it has to do its own government filings. It has to pay its own taxes. Um, it is not like your personal piggy bank, right? It is a separate legal entity. It's considered a person under the law, okay? Um, why do a lot of people create corporations? Well, as, as we think about the furniture breaking example, or if we talk about the poisonous paint example, it keeps the business risks in the business, like the liabilities in the business, and it protects your personal assets, right? But having said that, again, it's not something to jump into without realizing if you are a director of that corporation, and every direct, every corporation must have directors, and there are requirements uh, um, on the directors and, and um, sorry, there's obligations that directors have, but also not just anybody can be a director, right? You, you, they, there are uh, uh, requirements of who can be a director, but the directors have personal liability for the behavior of the corporation. And that is because the directors are considered to be the controlling minds of the corporation, right? It's the directors who, who, appoint the officers, right? It's a board of directors who is appointing the president. And so what I find with very small businesses, I mean, even, even medium-sized businesses, is the business owner doesn't always understand that the shareholder, the directors, and the officers are all separate entities. In a small business, you might be the shareholder, and you might be the director, and you might be an officer. So you are occupying three different roles. So it is the directors who bear the personal liability. So be aware of that if you're a director 
of someone else's company. Um, it's always a good idea to think about if you should to look into directors and officer liability insurance. Again, you may decide that there's no risk. It's not a cost you want to incur, but still be aware of it, right? Um, generally speaking, the idea is the higher the risk involved in your business, uh, and I don't mean finance, I don't mean risk in terms of will the business succeed or fail, but I mean, are the activities that your business um, engages in um, a higher risk kind of a business, it's always best to incorporate sooner rather than later uh, in order to reduce personal liability. Um, and, you, and, and, and to be clear, if you incorporate, you most likely will have higher costs. It costs money to incorporate, even if you do it yourself. Um, you'll pay, be paying more in terms of getting your tax, the taxes done, because now you'll be getting someone to do the taxes of the business. And there are annual filings that you should be doing. So there is more work and there is more cost. And so, you know, you just want to have a full picture of the pros and cons of each of these business structures. And to, to go over it again, it's sole proprietorship, partnership, and corporation. Um, Diana, were there any questions that are relate to that section? Before? Um, I don't see anything in the chat. So does anyone okay. have any questions in the audience? I think we're good. Okay. Um, go, so I'm going to look at my notes to see how many more pages I have on this topic. What's a LLC? Um, that is, uh, so that's a limited liability corporation. Um, are you in, um, are you in Ontario? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and did you come across it in Ontario or did you come across that somewhere else? No, I've seen it in the U.S. So it's just curious. Yeah. It's just a limited liability corporation. So we don't generally, generally speaking, generally speaking, I mean, never say never. Uh, we generally don't have that in, the, in Canada, but we have corporations. And so not, not every business tool that's used in the U.S. has the same name that it has in Canada. Okay. I see a couple here. questions okay, in sure. the chat, actually. Uh, first question from BP Raj, um, is it possible to register the company in a DIY mode? So registering is not the same as incorporating. So uh, one thing to be clear with when you're working with lawyers and accountants and others is really make sure you're using the terminology that they are expecting or to clarify. So you can register a trade name or a business name but that's not the same as incorporating. You can definitely incorporate your own business. The filing fee, I, I, th I think it's around it's about $300. Something. Yeah, $250, $300. So when I do work, like just as an example, when I do work for a business incorporating them, my fee is not, um, my, my fee includes what's called incorporating them and it includes organizing them. So organizing them is doing all of the organizational resolutions, issuing the shares, having their minute book created. So I have one client, for example, uh, husband and wife, they incorporated themselves uh, 16 years ago and did not organize themselves, didn't do any annual filings, didn't do the initial shareholders resolutions, directors resolutions, office like directors consents, none of that and so they came to me because they were thinking of selling the business or trying to get a bigger loan from the bank and the buyer or the bank is going to want to make sure that you're that the, that the house is in order so they came and i had to do 16 years of that and luckily they had um good um financial statements and so i was able to work with the accountant to create all of this this documentation but in my experience when companies incorporate themselves, they just do the incorporation, but they don't do the organization. And when I work with a company, uh, a lot of my cost is coming from the organizational side. Like there could be like 20 documents we have to prepare. And people who do it DIY don't seem to do that part of it. 
So just, just something to be aware of. So if anybody is saying to you, do it yourself, ask them what they have done about their bylaws, about all the shareholders resolutions, the officers appointment, the director's resolutions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, that's a good question. Um, any, okay. Anyone else right now? Yeah, a couple more questions. Uh, next question is from Demetrius. Why is it better to do risks earlier? Like if it's a higher risk business? Is that the question? I'm assuming so. Demetrius, do you want to unmute your mic and clarify your question? Um, yeah, if you go back one slide. Sorry. Yeah, so that says the higher the risk in the business. Okay, so imagine if my business is I have a a bungee jumping business. Okay. And so, so let's say I have a bungee jumping business and you have a business where you're selling stationary. Okay. So is there a greater likelihood that my customers will be injured from my business or your customers will be injured from your business? It would be the bungee uh, jumping business. Okay. So I just have a bigger risk profile and so let's say if somebody does get injured, the likelihood of their injury, like, okay, so let's say someone gets a paper cut in your business, from your customer gets a paper cut and my customer falls out of like, something happens and the bungee cord wasn't secured properly or it was secured properly, but the tension wasn't right. And now they've injured their back, okay? So if, our business is reliable for the injury, what, which injury is gonna cost more, right? It's a bungee jumping injury. If I've got someone now whose back is injured and they can't work for the rest of their life because of something I have done, the risk to me to have to pay um, um, as a result of what I have done to them the, the cost is just going to be much bigger to me than the cost is to you if your the injury you've caused is a paper cut, right? So some of this can be mitigated uh, by talking to your insurance company and finding out, okay, what kind of insurance do I should I have for this kind of a business? What will this protect me against? So that's what I mean. The higher the risks involved in your industry, the higher the risks in your in your business, you need to think about could your personal finances withstand that personal liability? Because remember, if you don't incorporate and you're a sole proprietor or in a partnership as a sole, as, a, as, a, as an individual, those kinds of risks come out of your pocket. Like, are you prepared to put your house on the line or your RSPs on the line or your kids' education fund on the line? Now it's, it's different for professionals, right? Uh, accountants, lawyers, doctors, we can't do that. We still keep the personal liability anyway. And that's why professional corporations have different rules than regular corporations. But that's why, that's why I say that. So I hope that clarifies. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, so who is responsible for the minute books? Um, that's a great question. I mean, you can make that decision. So the minute book itself is a is a book, right? Now it's virtual or hard copy. Before it was hard copy. So um, often, not always, but often it was something that was kept at the lawyer's office and they would update it. Now, of course, it can't be updated without the involvement of the business because the directors and the shareholders have to sign annual resolutions. Um, but it's often kept at law firms. Um, now that things are virtual, um, I offer my clients the option um, that I can keep it. I mean, if it's virtual, I would rather just send it to them or create a file where they can access it, right? Um, I know sometimes accountants do it, but I, I don't know that they're necessary. I, I don't know if they're doing the resolutions as they should be doing the resolutions. I, I don't know if that's part of their service. And if they say it's part of their service, I don't know if they're necessarily, um, if that's really part of their business that they should be doing. I, I, that I can't comment on. But um, there's no reason a client can't keep their own minute book. 
Okay, and last question we're going to take for this uh, section is a couple years ago I incorporated because I worked as a contractor for a company who required that I set up a corporation. Now that I'm starting a company, could I use the corporation I created a couple of years ago? That's a great question. So when you incorporate, there's basically like 10 questions or 10 sections. And one of them, I think it's section five, um, it's called restrictions. And so in that, some people will say, this corporation shall only be in the business of X. If your articles of incorporation say that, then no, you can't use your that business, that corporation for a different business. But if there are no restrictions in, in articles of incorporation, then I don't see a reason why a business could not change the, the kind of business it is doing. So you'd have to go back and read what your articles of incorporation say and see if you if you put any restrictions on it. Okay, um, those are all the questions we have for now. So I think we're good to Okay, move on. good. I actually uh, did have a few more things to say about corporations. Um, so as I said, lawyers and accountants can do the incorporation and the incorporation part, you, obviously people can do it by themselves. Um, but what I see is when people do it by themselves, they are not doing the second part, which is called the organization. And if you, so if you're incorporating an Ontario company, the relevant legislation is the Ontario Business Corporations Act, the OBC, the OBCA. In it, it says that you must organize your business within X number of months of incorporating. So do you have to do it on day one? No, you'd have to consult what the act says about how much time you have. But I find that that's something that D DIYers don't, uh, they don't really um, know the, what's the, what the requirements are of them in the Ontario Business Corporations Act. Or if you incorporate federally, the act or the legislation is the Canada Business Corporations Act. Roughly speaking, or generally speaking, the Business Corporations Act in every province and federally are very, very similar. Um, so you do, are required to organize, but you don't necessarily have to do it on day one. Okay, we've already talked about a few of these items. Um, I'm gonna talk about the shareholder stuff and investors in the next slide. So I'm not gonna talk about it here. Um, so articles, bylaws, appointments of officers and directors. Um, the articles are what you get when you incorporate. So keep those. So it's, at, it's at the birth certificate of your of your corporation, uh, and you need it to get your business registration number um, for taxes and all that. And then the bylaws and appointments, etc., is what I'm talking about in terms of the organizational documents. And then some of these documents must be kept up to date on a yearly basis. Other documents must be filed within X number of days of a certain event happening. So for example, if you incorporate and you're the director, but two months later, you bring another director on, you are obligated under the law to notify um, the appropriate government ministry and file an update within, and you have to check the act, but it's within 10 to 15 days. So not, not a lot of people um, are aware of these deadlines. Okay, so I'm going to go on now and I want to talk about shares and shareholders. So I've kept this high level on purpose. So there's a lot more we could say about this, but just for today's purposes. So if you incorporate, okay, and I'm not talking about not for profits, I'm just talking about for profit businesses. If you incorporate, who will be the shareholders? It, there has to be at least one shareholder. Will it just be you? Like, will you be the sole shareholder? Um, or will there be other shareholders? If there are other shareholders, what will their role in the business be, if any? Um, so are you two or three people who've come together to create a business? Are you all gonna have a third, a third, a third of the shares? And are you all running the business together? 
Like, will you all be directors? Will one be the CEO? Will one be the president? Will one be the treasurer? Or will some people be actively involved in running the business and will other people be investors? Um, so when you are creating your corporation, think about who are the shareholders to be and what is the role of those shareholders in the business, if any. Um, I'll give you an example. If you have, if you are an active participant in the growth of the business and you're building, you're managing the business in your role as a director and you're also a shareholder, what if you have somebody who's interested in investing money, but they don't know anything about business and they don't really want to be involved in running the business, they just want to get like a 10% dividend each year, right? Are you going to create, are you going to issue them the same kind of shares that you get? Or are you going to give them a share that gives them a dividend, but where they are not allowed to vote at shareholder meetings because you don't want them to be involved in the business? And maybe they don't want to be involved in the business either. If this is the case, that that is a minimum of two class of shares in your business. One share that has the right to vote and one share that does not have the right to vote. So when you incorporate your business, one of the questions that it will ask you, whether you're a do-it-yourselfer or not, it'll ask you but how many classes of shares you wish to incorporate. And secondly, it will ask you, what are the attributes of these shares? Meaning, are they voting? Are they non-voting? Uh, will they get dividends? Um, will they be, um, well, do they get the, the assets of the business first, if the business uh, gets sold? So these are things to think about. And you might decide, I just want to incorporate, I'm going to do unlimited, you know, common shares, and I'll worry about these things later, which is certainly an option. And if you do want to change the kinds of shares, the classes, the classes of shares, and the attributes of the shares at a later time, you can do that. And you must file a new government form called Articles of Amendment. So this is legally changing the structure of the business. It can be done later for a filing fee. And if you use a lawyer, um, obviously there are time. Um, on the other hand, you might wish to think about these things when you incorporate. To if you already know what it is you have in mind. So there's a lot we can say, there's a lot we can say here. Um, my, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to communicate to you is that you can change your mind about these things. There might be some additional steps that are needed later if you wish to um, create a whole bunch of different classes of shares or your business strategy or your business plans change. So you're not locked into one uh, structure for your business. Having said that, think about what your plans are. Are you planning on having partners? Are you planning on having silent investors? Are you planning on having angel investors where, again, they want to have proceeds coming out of the business like dividends, but they're not interested in um, controlling the business? So think about all of these things, even if it's just you and one other person. So what is it that you expect these other shareholders to do? And what do they expect? And is it the same? Um, do you have plans to create a shareholders agreement? And like I had said earlier, when we talked about the partnership agreement, um, the real, one of the real benefits of these agreements is that you have a, a process by which you will exit the relationship. Um, there's a, an example, a friend of mine was telling me about a file he's working on where uh, a corporation made up of three shareholders are trying to buy another company, but then they all started fighting. And so now it's totally up in the air what's going to happen with the business they're planning on buying. The existence of their company is now up in the air. And so the question is, well, who's going to get the business? So there's three shareholders 
And so that kind of thing would be laid out in the shareholders agreement. They would set out a process on how to exit. But if you don't have that kind of an agreement, it, it can be uh, much more difficult. So before you move on, a couple questions yeah. about this topic in the chat. Uh, first one comes from Karina. Uh, if you're doing a corporation in a partnership, can you be a part of the same class structure or are you obliged to create more than one class? You're, you're not obliged to create more than one class. So it really comes down to what, what is the nature of your arrangement? So for example, are you both expecting to get the same voting rights and the same dividends? Or is one person, is the arrangement that one person is going to get you know, their money out faster, that they're gonna get a bigger dividend? So however you treat one shareholder, you must treat every shareholder that owns the same shares in the same way. If the plan is to treat people differently, then there must be different classes of share because everyone who owns every share, every share of the same kind must get the same treatment. If you want to treat them differently, then they must be different kinds of shares. If that makes sense. That makes sense. Are there any benefits to having more than one class structure? Um, when it's a partnership? I think, um, okay. so, so we're gonna be careful about using the word partnership because a partnership is not, is not a corporation. Um, but if you have business partners in your, so let's, so give me, give me an example. I'll just make up a hypothetical. <laughs> Uh, so I'm starting a business with a friend and we are starting to <laughs> incorporate. I mean, I guess it's not much of a hypothetical and um, we're in the process of deciding um, our responsibilities in this partnership. And uh, yeah, so essentially just trying to figure out what the responsibilities would be and to see if it will be more of an equal um, share or would one of us be more responsible? So I think, I think you would need to <clears throat> sort that out first, right? Like I, um, I, don't, I don't believe in the tail wagging the dog. So I wouldn't worry about, um, I would first make sure that you and your partner or you and your, your business partner are clear on what your both both of your expectations are and from there then you can look at these kinds of things so for example if you're each if every if you're each going to have an equal vote so meaning if one person owns 50 shares and the other person owns 50 shares and the idea is that each share has an equal vote then that's one um, one thing to think about, but if the idea is that one person is going to run the business uh, and the other person is there to get their investment back but not run the business, then you might want to consider, well, does that person need voting shares? So in my view, what I would, what I would recommend is always figure out what you want the business to be first, like what it, what is the agreement that you and your your uh, uh, your business partner and you have? Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions. Um, next question comes from Aaron. What happens if I'm incorporated and it's just myself in the business? Uh, do we still have to organize all of this as well? Yes. Okay. Yeah, if you, read, if you read the act, the act does not say you only have to do this if there's two people. Yeah, right. I think that was, as some yeah. people assume that it's just me, why would I have to do all of this? Because you have to look at the act. The act will say shareholders must appoint um, the directors. So maybe it's the sole shareholder who's appointing one officer or one director so the number of people doesn't matter, but what matters is 
this body called the shareholders are the ones who pass a resolution, an annual resolution, saying who is going to run the company. So that could be one director, it could be 10 directors. So is it is it the highest risk thing to do? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, the act does give you some time to put this in place. But just because you're one person doesn't mean it does not need to be done. Good question. Uh, two more questions I see in the chat. Next one comes from Shankar. Should a shareholder agreement or partnership agreement be made with a lawyer? Um, you mean have a lawyer write the agreement for you? Or do you mean if your lawyer is your business partner? Um, yeah, I mean, like have the lawyer write it for you. So, so here's, my, here's my perspective. You need to make sure that the agreement, whatever the agreement is, is applicable in the jurisdiction that your business is incorporated. And so what I have seen a lot of is when people go online to find things, they don't know what jurisdiction it's from, right? Oh, this is the shareholders agreement my friend used in Texas. Well, your business has been incorporated in Ontario, not in Texas. So there's one thing that's different and has that shareholders agreement that you are planning on writing yourself does it cover off what we consider to be um, the normal topics? And does it have the benefit of incorporating case law, like newer cases that have been de determined in the courts compared to an agreement that might've been used in a previous business you had 10 years ago, right? So these are, these are some of the things to consider. Now, on the other hand, you just want, the, you just want your shareholders agreement to very clearly set out um, the responsibilities of the shareholders. You want it to set out which decisions must be made unanimously, if at all, or can all decisions be made um, by a majority of shareholders? So that's one of those topics you would often see in a shareholders agreement is which decisions um, need, can be made um, by majority versus what's called a supermajority or a special resolution. And the, the biggest element of a shareholders agreement is how do you exit? Mm -hmm. So what happens if you die? What happens to the shares? Right. right. Does your spouse get them? So does your business partner want to be in business with your spouse? Is your spouse, um, or would your business partner want the option to buy the shares and pay your estate? Like it's a, it's a, it's a scary example, but I'm just saying in a worst case scenario, what would happen and what would you want to have happen? Or if you and your business partner, one of you wants to exit, how do you determine? And then one wants to stay and buy your shares. So how do you determine what, what price your business partner will pay you out at? Yeah. So right. would it be better to work with a lawyer for it? I mean, if I say yes, you're going to say, of course, she's going to say that she's a lawyer, uh, which is which is partly true. But I think I think just this is my approach to all law things. Think about the worst case scenario, right? In 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 these three or four worst case scenarios, is it clear enough what it is that you would want to have happen? And I would a shareholders agreement. Um, I remember once a client said, "It'll give me a short one." And I, the shortest one I could do was like 30 pages long. Like they're, they really kind of go into in this, if this happens, we'll do it this way. If this other thing happens, we'll do it that way. So, you know, a big part of shareholders agreements talks about um, what kind of decisions can be done on a majority basis or what kind of decisions need to be done at higher than a majority basis, right? The act already says some things must be done at what's called a supermajority. It's like a, like a two thirds or two thirds and one. But you might decide, well, we want all of these decisions to be made at this supermajority level, right? Okay. And then the, but the big thing really is how do you exit, right? If, uh, 
if Amazon comes and they want to buy your business, do you have to sell? What if one of you wants to sell and the other one doesn't want to sell? Yeah. Right? So, so those are the kinds of things that a shareholders agreement would go into. A lot of what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you kind of have to think about all the possibilities there. Um, so next question that I see in the chat, and this is the final one we're going to take for this aspect of the presentation. Uh, so does every class of share get the same information of the state of the corporation at the same time? Oh, that is a very good, that's a very good question. And now you're testing my knowledge of who gets information. Is it, oh my gosh, I should know this question. Let me, you know what, do we have a distribution list of who attended? Yep, we do. Okay, I'm gonna I'm going to write you an answer because I'd be too embarrassed if I got the answer wrong. And it's sort of a it's like a it's like it's binary. It's this or that, and I just have to check my textbook. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think. That that's an excellent question. I don't. I have to come back to you with the answer. But good question. Good questions. <laughs> Very good question. So we, we definitely can come back to that and, and okay. send that out to everyone once okay, we get, uh, make sure we get the correct answer. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I think we covered, we covered all of this. So the, the point I really wanna make here, right? And again, it's similar to what I said earlier about whether you're gonna be a sole proprietor or a partnership or a corporation, don't get into like analysis paralysis. So I have to make it perfect so I can't do anything. You can change these things. Sometimes, the, sometimes you might decide to do what's sort of less expensive now, and then as your business grows and the needs change, then you might, you know, let's say do articles of amendment, change something. Um, but on the other hand, just think about what are your plans for your business that you are aware of now, right? Are you looking to get investors, or are you looking to, you know, you're not necessarily looking for investors. You're not necessarily looking to be the next unicorn that's going to be bought out by, you know, a bigger tech company. So do some thinking about what, what your plans are. And if you can incorporate that when you set up, great. If you can't think that far ahead in the beginning, you just want to see if you have a viable business, well, then you can go back and change some of these things later. So more, uh, let me just move this down. Now more on the nuts and bolts of your business, right? Is, does your business require any licenses? And if so, have you, got, have you gone out to get those licenses, right? So you wanna look up getting a, a master business license, like look that up. But you also wanna see if there's any specific licenses that you need for your business. So for example, <clears throat> if you have a restaurant and you want to serve alcohol, well, you have to get a special license to serve alcohol, right? So you need to do some research in your industry to see what kinds of licenses you might require. Um, similarly, business name registration. Um, are you going to have a business name that is different from the name of your incorporated company? So maybe you've incorporated 123 Ontario Inc, but you really want your business name to be Crazy Cupcakes, right? That's what it's gonna be, your logo, that's what's gonna be on the name of your shop, or your business cards. So you have to make sure you're doing the appropriate business name registrations. Uh, and then don't forget to get your HST slash GST registration number as well. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, sorry, I'm just moving around. Uh, okay, um, I'm not gonna get into HR structure a lot because it's not my area of practice, but I just wanted to flag it for you as something to consider in your business. So you can have employees work for you. You can have nobody work for you, right? Do it all yourself. Or you might hire consultants or independent contractors who do some work for you um, on... Um, on this independent contractor basis where you were not responsible for their pension or their benefits or, 
or that kind of thing where you pay them for work done, but you're not paying them on like a weekly, hourly or monthly basis. Like they're not a regular employee. So the thing to be careful about here is if you treat them like an employee, if they work like an employee, having a document that says independent contractor agreement doesn't like that's not going to fool the courts. So if you are hiring people in your business as independent contractors, then they must be independent contractors, right? If you hire them as independent contractor uh, and you are their only client and they are doing 40 hours a week for you and the loss of your business uh, could really harm them, um, it's possible that the courts will not consider that to be an independent contractor relationship. So this is one of those areas to definitely invest in getting proper advice, because if you hire people thinking that you have set it up as an independent contractor relationship and you were wrong, then you could be on the hook for all of these employee costs retroactively, right? So sometimes you need to look at the cost of the advice as a preventative measure to make sure that you're setting things up properly, okay? Um, other questions, uh, regardless of who's working for you, um, are there um, confidentiality provisions in your contracts with them, whether they are employees or independent contractors or suppliers even? Um, who owns the intellectual property rights? So if you've hired somebody you know, you've got a website design business and you've hired someone as an independent contractor to help you create some, um, some images, who owns them? You or them, right? Okay, and then also um, think about things, again, on the topic of people working for you, you know, is it necessary to have health and safety policies, especially considering COVID? Are these things that you have you have thought about? And if not, should you be thinking about them? Okay, I'll take you to the next slide. Oh, this doesn't want to go now. Am I, do I still have, okay, here we go. Okay, so now we're gonna get, unless there's any questions on the business structures or on the HR stuff, I wanted to get into my favorite section, which is the running of your business. So all we that had, stuff we, we actually had, sorry, Amy, we had oh. one question in the chat that I don't want to okay. miss. Um, it was, came from Linda. And when should we do uh, HST or GST registrations? Um, so, so I'm not a tax expert at all. So when you incorporate your business, you will get a letter from like Revenue Canada and it'll have your number in the, in the letter. Okay. okay, I'm not talking about incorporated though, okay. just as a sole proprietor okay. to register for GST. So, so that's a tax, that's a tax question. Um, and I'm not here to give tax advice. My understanding is if you are selling, if you are selling more than $30,000 Canadian in a quarter, you are required to have one. Okay, thanks. But there might be reasons to get your GST number anyway, even if you're not selling that volume. Right? I mean, you can register for one at any time. You don't need to be incorporated to get one. No, but what would the advantage be if you're not earning that kind of um, uh, dollar amount in sales? What, why would you want to get uh, Again, that, 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 that's, not a, that's not a legal question. I'll just give you okay. my personal experience. Yeah. yeah. So um, one, um, many customers will expect you to have one. So they will okay. ask you for one, like especially if you're dealing with bigger customers, uh, bigger companies. Um, and secondly, I mean, it allows you to pass through the GSD costs or HSD costs that you're paying in, in, the, in the supply of things into your business. Okay. I mean, you have to you have to remit what you're getting, but then you would deduct from that what you have already paid. Again, these are tax questions, but in my experience, bigger companies you deal with will expect that you have one. Yes, thank you. 
And Linda, just a note, we have our finance section uh, session next week. Um, so you'll be able to get an in-depth answer from our expert on, on that question. Great. Yeah, Thank don't you. take tax advice from a lawyer, but don't take legal <laughs> advice from your tax accountant because they will give it to you. They will give you legal advice, but don't take it. Okay. Okay, so now I want to get into my favorite part. So this is the commercial side, the, the buying and the selling. Okay, buying and selling things because most businesses, that's what you're there to do. Okay. And so when you are selling, are you selling to other businesses or are you selling to consumers? Similarly, when you're buying, you might approach your relationships and your negotiations with your supply chain differently than how you handle things with your customers. Okay, so ask yourself in your business, because all of this is relevant when it comes to um, reducing risk and when it comes to uh, you know, getting into your written contracts, right? Who are you selling to? You know, what are you selling? How are you selling? Are you doing things differently depending on who you are selling to? So if you've got different customers, are you doing, um, you know, are you doing different things depending upon which customer you're selling to? Okay. And so why do these things matter? Because I will, I will tell you when I, when I work with, with companies and I help them write their contracts or negotiate their contracts, if there's a problem later, very often the problem is not the, the legalese, like the contractual commitments in the agreement. The problem is usually on the who, the what, the how. The problems are usually on the delivery expectations were unclear, the volume was unclear, the time frame was unclear, exactly what you were going to do, the scope was unclear. So this obviously is going to be different if your business is just selling things or commodities versus if you're selling services. And these are bigger problems. The bigger the thing you are that you are selling and the longer the time horizon of the relationship with your customer, right? But these are things to really think about because these things should be in your contract, okay? Similarly, when you're dealing with your supply chain, who are you buying from? What are you buying from them? How are you buying it from them? And would you do the things differently depending on who your suppliers are? Are you gonna treat your website designer who's gonna update your website once a year or maybe just once in total differently from a supplier where you are you know, doing some sort of tech purchase where you have an automatic renewal clause in the contract where you just keep you know, rolling over that contract and you're buying a service every month, right? The terms and conditions of your contract are gonna be different because what you are buying is different, okay? So when you are dealing with your customers, some scenarios could include, your customer could be buying something from you. You might be, you know, a unique business, your boutique business, you're introducing some new fancy kind of vinegar. I don't know, you're making a vinegar, and you're, and you're using very specific Ontario ingredients and you've gone from the farmer's market. Now you're getting into like selling at the bigger shops, okay? The point is you're a small business and now your customer that you're selling to is a big sophisticated business, right? So has anyone, you know, been in that scenario, right? Where the, where the negotiating leverage that they have is different than the negotiating leverage that you have you know, do you have a contract template that you like your customers to use? Or does your customer say, here is what we send to all of our suppliers and this is what you have to sign, right? Their terms and conditions who most likely will favor them to your detriment. They will potentially probably have more leverage and they'll try to dictate the terms. You know, an example could be you might want to be paid up front or get paid 50% up front and 50% on delivery. And they might say, we'll pay you in 90 days after delivery. 
right? Maybe your business can't survive if you have to wait that long. Or their, their standard terms and conditions might say, uh, we own all of your intellectual property, even though the salesperson you're dealing with says, oh, you can own the IP, we don't want it. But what if the terms and conditions are different from what the salesperson or the buyer told you? Because the buyer's never, the buyer at the customer has never read the terms and conditions, right? Um, or a lot of the times, if you're doing a service kind of a work, the customer might expect you to have certain kinds of insurances in place that you might feel like are totally unrelated to the work that you are doing. And now this is just going to add a cost that you were not expecting. And so do you say we're not going to get that insurance um, or do you pass the cost of the insurance to them? Whatever. So. So what I'm really trying to say here is, have you found yourself in any of these scenarios? And do you feel like A, you would recognize these issues? And B, do you feel like you can push back on your customer to get them to change the contract? So what I want, what I want to, I guess, convey here is most likely, not 100%, but most likely I would expect that if you're dealing with bigger customers, they're gonna have their terms and conditions that they're gonna to send to you. And that the buyer that you are dealing with probably doesn't really understand the terms and conditions and may or may not be uh, empowered to change the terms and conditions and is gonna tell you things like, oh, you have to accept these like this, you can't change them, right? And that's not necessarily true, but you wouldn't know what to push back on unless you read the agreement and unless you understood the agreement. And so this is one of those things where I think it's really important for businesses to invest the time in learning what is it that the contract is saying and identifying things that are so important to your business that you will not sign the contract unless that thing is in the contract and being able to identify when that thing is missing, right? Or recognizing what the issue is and saying, okay, if my customer doesn't give this thing to me, here is my backup plan in terms of how I'm gonna protect myself. And I'm really sorry, you can probably hear my kitchen and kids in the background, uh, couldn't keep them out after it got dark. So they're home now, so I apologize. But anyway, so the, the point isn't to say, oh, you don't know these things. That's not my point at all. And if that's how I came across, I really apologize. All I'm trying to say is you are the expert at your business. You are the expert at understanding what risks your business can tolerate and what, business, what risks your business cannot tolerate. And so make sure that you see that in the contracts. And if you don't see that in the contracts, is that because you don't know how to read a contract or is it because the concept that you're looking for is written in a way that is um, different than what you are used to, right? I have some clients where they will only do a contract if they get paid up front. That's it. If they don't get paid up front, they're like, we can't do this contract because we can't, we don't have the money to run the business. And depending, and, and their service is the kind of thing that their customers are saying, fine, we'll make that work. I have another client where to grow their business, it's really important for them to put their customers' logos on their website. And that's, the hill they're going to die on in contract negotiations because it's been really helpful for them to grow their business when other companies see oh they're working for apple or, or walmart so that's the kind of thing that they know to look for in the contracts so just something for you to be aware of is a what do you need the contracts to say or not to say and b do you understand the contracts that you are signing? And C, 
do you feel like you have no ability to influence what that contract says? Because for that one, I will say, yes, you do. It might not be to change everything, but it could be to change those things that are really, really key for your business. See, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, so Cindy is wondering what type of lawyer we would get for this type of business review of contracts. That's, that's a great question. You want, a, you want a business lawyer. You want somebody who's used to negotiating commercial contracts. So um, in, my, in my experience, I mean, like this is something that I do. And I know the big law firms all do that. In terms of the smaller law firms, oh, now the dog's barking. Um, I find the smaller law firms, you do have to ask that question. So I would, I would just ask that question. And Cindy, I'm going to actually move that question to the end because there I do have a slide on working with, with lawyers because I think that's an excellent question. And I think you should interview your lawyers before you hire them to see if they've done the kinds of things that you want them to do, if they have done them before. Okay. And I think a okay. follow-up question uh, came from Jeff. Is, is it the same for liability waiver reviews? For sure. Okay. And last question comes from Karina. What is the purpose of a master business license? Oh, um, when it comes to a license, like, li like the word license tells you it's a requirement, right? So it's just, it's just looking, look up the link that I sent you and just make sure that if you need it, you have it. Okay, a license basically is government permission to do what you're doing. And so you need to see which businesses that applies to. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to the next page. Oops, this thing doesn't like to move right away. Okay, so the previous page was dealing with other businesses, but are you dealing directly with consumers? In which case there's other things that you might need to think about. Um, there might be a lot of similarities between the contracts you have dealing with businesses versus dealing with consumers, but there might be some differences. So for example, um, data privacy is a very, uh, very key business risk that is just sort of starting to, I think, um, uh, reach the level of business owners' ears, right? Like we've known for a long time, it's an issue, but it can be a topic that people know is an issue, but they not, might not necessarily know how to think about that issue and think about how it applies to their business, okay? So I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because again, we could talk about privacy the whole day. Um, if it's okay with Diana, um, I wrote a blog, two blogs about privacy and how it could apply to your business, your small business. So I'll just send it to Diana and she can circulate it. And why I like that is I, I worked with a well-known privacy lawyer and we made up examples, right? What if you're this kind of business? What if you're this kind of business? Because it's going to be different based on the kind of business you have, right? You just have to really think about in my business, what kind of personal information do I touch? And what kind of measures do you have in place to protect that information? And what kind of steps are you taking to get the consent from your customers that you, that you take that information? How long are you keeping it for? Do you have a way to effectively and permanently delete it um, at an appropriate time? And questions like that. So data privacy is a very important area. And if you're dealing with credit card information, if you've got people's home addresses because you're shipping stuff to them, if you're in some kind of a health related industry and you have like health information of people, um, you know, if you're taking like um, information from people who are visiting your website, right? Are you appropriately protecting their privacy? And are you aware of what you need to do to protect yourself so that you're not found to be violating privacy laws, right? Um, 
you know, if you're dealing with consumers or anybody, do you have appropriate terms of use on your website? I was talking to somebody last week where they sell um, retreats from their website, but nothing on their website has any terms and conditions about what happens when you buy a retreat from them. So what happens if there's bad weather? Or what happens if because of COVID, um, people cannot cross the border? The website doesn't, doesn't cover that. So does your website have terms and conditions on there that are appropriate to what you are selling from your website, if you are selling from your website, right? Um, other things to think about is depending on your marketing and however you're connecting with consumers, just consumer protection laws, right? Because you know the government wants to protect, as they should, consumers from businesses. And so just how much are you aware of these things? So again, we could go on and on, but just to think about, are, are these things on your radar? And if they're not, do you have some uh, educating to do, self-educating to do around some of these topics? Okay, actually, before I go to the next page, I'll look at Castle, Canada's anti-spam legislation. Um, do you have people's consent to email them? So a lot of businesses are, use different kinds of email marketing, but have you followed the legislation, um, Canada's anti-spam legislation, to make sure that you are appropriately uh, using those email addresses? Okay, so, so now I was gonna move on to suppliers uh, and we just dealt with customers. Were there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Okay. So going on then to suppliers. So a lot of the same topics are gonna to come up, which isn't surprising because contracts usually cover similar topics, um, whether you're buying or whether you're selling. The reason I separate this out though, is because a lot of companies spend a lot of effort on the contracts they have with their customers, but they don't really spend the same amount of time thinking about the contracts that they have with their suppliers. Um, and if someone is your supplier, well, you, you are their customer. So they probably are thinking about the contract with you. So again, you could be buying from a supplier who's a much more sophisticated or bigger business. So if anyone's ever bought a license from Microsoft, right? You're the customer, you're buying from them, but you know they're not gonna use your terms and conditions, right? So do you have any um, terms and conditions that you require that your suppliers meet any delivery dates? You know, what if the stuff that they sell you that you need to run your business doesn't work? What if that stuff comes late? Um, you know, what if they go out of business? Do you do you are you stuck, or is there some sort of a mechanism in the contract? Like let's say if you're buying software, where there is some way that they either can put the software into escrow. Uh, I'm not saying these are all, have the all same likelihood to happen. I'm just saying um, there are, there's a different way of thinking when you're thinking about your suppliers because typically they are, you're relying on them to help you run your business. So have you thought about um, what you want from them? And is that reflected in the contract, right? Do you have your own standard form contract you use with them or are they giving you theirs? Usually, not 100%, but in my experience, usually whoever wrote the contract, um, it's more in their favor. And so you do need to read it. Um, I do like it when I come across contracts that are more fair. I think that saves everybody a lot of time and time is money. Um, but you do, you do want to make sure you are reading these as well. So I'll, I'll come, so here's one thing I've often seen in a supply contract where you're signing the supplier's contract. I've often seen that they will limit their liability to something very, very small, 
right? If our stuff doesn't work and it causes you damage, well, the limited liability is going to be whatever you paid us for the last three months. And then you look at the limited liability clause in your contract with your customer, if it's a big company, and they want you on the hook for like, sometimes they don't even have a limited liability in their contracts, which to me is crazy. You should always have a limited liability. Um, or they will try to make it very big, but your suppliers will always try to make it very small. So do you have sort of a, a set amount that you think is appropriate in you, for your business when you're dealing with suppliers or if you're dealing with customers? Okay. Okay, so generally speaking, when it comes to contracts, and I've already made a lot of these points, but if I had to put them into one spot, okay, read your contracts before signing. Sounds like an obvious thing to say, but read them. Even if you can't change what they say, you need to understand them. Secondly, in your corporation or in your business, however you have structured it, who has the authority to sign the contract? So if you have employees in your business, for example, do they have the authority to sign, enter into contracts without discussing it with you first? Um, or are you the only one who can sign them? Um, if you are negotiating with somebody and you don't understand a section of a contract, don't be afraid to ask them because they might not understand it either. Especially if you're dealing with a buyer of a bigger organization, um, they might not necessarily know why their contracts say what they say. And if they tell you, oh, it means this, it means that, you should still read it to make sure that they've got it right. Because at the end of the day, if you run into a problem later, it's not going to matter what the other person said. What's going to matter is what the written contract says. Um, create, oh, sorry, uh, create for yourself a set of key commercial terms. So remember I told you about my, well, I have a client who needs the logo on the website or who needs to be paid up front. So think about what are your key commercial terms, right? But separate that from what are your key legal terms? So for example, what kind of liabilities are you comfortable accepting? Um, what kind of force majeure are you comfortable accepting? Um, do you understand, um, I'm trying to think of another one, the difference between a liability and an indemnity, right? So if you have these two things clear, it also will help you uh, reduce your cost, I think, if you're dealing with a lawyer, because you're going to be able to say, look, lawyer, I understand my business. I know what commercial terms I need, um, but I don't understand how these legal terms are written, and I need more help from you in that area. Okay. Okay. And then the last few things on negotiation. So I think I've got two slides left. Okay. It is all, in my experience, it is always worth to ask for the changes to the contract that you want or need for your business, but it is easier to do this if you have time. Um, if you're dealing with somebody on the other side who doesn't have authority to change the contract, then they have to take it up, up the chain if you're dealing with a bigger company. So you want to leave time for these conversations. Bigger companies find it hard to make change if they're short on time, okay? If you're dealing with someone else's lawyer, and I know you know this, but I'm gonna say it again, that lawyer is not acting for you. That lawyer is acting for their client. Um, and honestly, if I'm talking, if my business client organizes a meeting with the other company that we're negotiating with, and the other company does not bring its lawyer, I tell my client, I can't stay on this call. It's not, it's not appropriate that one side brings a lawyer and the other side doesn't. And so if they bring their lawyer on, I'll stay. If they don't bring their lawyer on, you know, I'll just tell my client, I'll catch up with you later. 
So if you are going to a meeting with somebody, and again, I know this might not fit where you are in your business right now, but you know, you're going to grow. You know, when you're going to a meeting that could involve some negotiations, ask them who's going to be there and ask them what their positions are. Um, that way you don't go into a negotiation uh, uh, sort of with a, um, like with less with less information than you should have, okay? Um, if you don't have a lawyer or you've decided not to involve one in your negotiations, um, don't negotiate with their lawyer for a business for business strategic reasons, and I'll tell you why. If if you're dealing with a customer who really wants your product, right? Um, and has promised you, okay, we'll, um, we'll reduce the limited liability to this amount, I'll ask our legal department to do it. We really want your business. Let, let, let the buyer of the other company, let them negotiate with their lawyer. Let them figure it out. Let that person who wants to buy from you be your advocate at the other company and tell their management team why they need to have a contract with you. Like let the buyer do their do that do this work for you. It, it doesn't always work out, but if it does, like strategically, it, it's just going to save time. Okay. And then I wanted to before I'm going on to my last slide. Was there anything anyone might want to raise here about negotiations? I don't say anything about negotiations. There were a few questions about um, the contract. One question about contracts. Okay, did you wanna throw yeah, out there? So this question comes from Shankar. What if the terms of the contract are ambiguous for both parties? Can I ask for the details from their lawyer? Absolutely, absolutely. Don't sign ambiguous contracts. Just, just don't sign them. If they're ambiguous, it just means that they're poorly written. And why are they poorly written? Right, like it, you should be clear on who's doing what to whom when, because if you have an ambiguous contract, it's just gonna turn into a problem, right? It should be clear to anyone reading that contract what's supposed to happen. This is what I always say, if we're negotiating a contract and we win the lottery and we don't go back to work the next day and our successors pick up that contract, it should be as clear to them people who weren't involved before what is supposed to happen so please do not sign ambiguous contracts it's not going to help you okay and those are okay. all the questions i see so far in the chat okay okay so the last thing i wanted to uh, um, share with you and again you might already know all of this so this might just be a reminder is when you're working with lawyers or accountants, and, and I'm sure this can apply to many other people that you are dealing with who are experts in their field or know more about their field than you know about their field, it's easy to feel intimidated, okay? So you're the customer, right? You're their client. So interview more than one. If, if, and you know, or if you're happy with the first one, that's great, but talk to more than one so that you find someone who you feel comfortable talking to because their advice to you is only gonna be as good as what they learn about your business. And if you're too uncomfortable to talk to them, um, they're not gonna be able to give you as good, a, as, as good advice as someone who understands your business, okay? Um, you want to work with people that you can ask questions of. Because, you know, if I give you a contract and it's ambiguous and you're like, well, I don't, she's not easy to talk to, I'll just accept this ambiguous contract. It hasn't helped your business. So you wanna work with people where you feel comfortable asking them questions, okay? Um, hopefully you can identify the people you would like to work with in advance because when you are, in a rush or something urgent comes up, it can take a long time for the for the onboarding type of stuff. Okay, uh, and you also you want to understand when you might be likely to need people um, to help you. 
um, make sure you understand the pricing structure. So is, is this person gonna work with you on an hourly rate basis or um, will you negotiate a fixed fee or do they offer a fixed fee? Um, are they gonna require that you pay them upfront before they do any work for you? These are all the kinds of questions that you should be clear. You should be clear on these things before you start working with them. Um, do they specialize in clients like you? Is that is that is that relevant? It it might not be relevant. Their their knowledge might be more relevant than how it applies to you. But if it is relevant, then you know there's you should ask these questions, and let them explain to you if they have worked clients like yours before or not. And that's it. I, I hope these have been helpful comments. And like I said, the idea was to bring you um, concepts. I bring you a lot of concepts, but at a high level. And I'm sure some are gonna be more applicable to you than others. So happy to take any comments and any feedback. If this was too high level, too detailed, uh, you know, always interested to hear people's feedback. Yep, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them in the chat or you can raise your hand, unmute your mics and ask your questions. This is really your chance. Oh, hi, um, my name is Tamara and I have a question about um, establishing contracts. Um, at which point would it be ideal? Um, so I'm just starting to navigate uh, a relationship with, uh, they're not a huge company. So it's not like, you know, a major like Loblaws, they're still somewhat niche in what they do. And they've asked me to supply um, my, my juice products on a regular basis. So we know um, about volume, we know about delivery times, we, we have all of that etched out even based on season. Um, I have set out some key terms to them, but this is all just via email about, you know, paying up front because my product is a perishable item. So, um, you know, I would like them to pay up front and, and make sure that then I, then I will deliver. Um, I don't want to be left with, you know, outstanding invoices for something that is like, can just go in a matter of 14 days. Um, some things that you've brought up have jogged my, my, my thinking about what I would like to include, but I'm just wondering, is it a right time to start thinking about a contract? I wor I've worked with other uh, restaurants and bars, et cetera, to provide them with juices. Um, and it, seem, it doesn't seem as formal as this because it's... Um, so bars will, you know, hit me up from with what their needs are on a, a, a case by case basis. So we need orange, we need this, we're doing this cocktail, whatever. Yeah. But companies being very specific, the timelines, everything is is it's a very different feel. It's a lot more structured, and I'm just wondering if this is the time that I I just set up and establish a contract. And even if I do do that, should I start to kind of work with my other restaurant and bar partners to start doing some things like that as well. Again, I'm, I'm biased. I think you should always have one. Now with your bar and restaurants, it sounds like what it's, what you're describing to me sounds like you would have like what's called an umbrella agreement or a master services agreement, which covers everything except the orders. And then you would have separate, like a one page or called a purchase order which is exactly like you say, we need 10 units of this on this day, these flavors, and then maybe next week, it's a different order so that those documents are just like you say, like an email or something really small. But the idea is for each of those orders, you already know, you've already agreed in advance who's doing the delivery, what time the delivery is coming, when are they paying, what the price is, that all the terms and conditions have already been sorted out. Yes. And so, so what you're talking about, in my, in my view, is like a master services agreement or framework or umbrella agreement, and then separate POs or purchase orders. Okay. Um, so, I mean, 
look, from, from, from a lawyer's point of view, the number one thing I always worry about is liability, right? Is like, what if somebody drinks your juice and they get sick? Yeah. Right. And so does anything in your communications with any of your customers, um, cover that now consumer stuff is different because if if somebody drinks something you can't stop them from suing you right but what you can do is say things in the contract like i'm selling this to you but you have to keep it um in the fridge at this temperature um and then that way <clears throat> you're able to defend yourself by saying look I sell it, they were supposed to put it in the freezer or the cooler at this temperature right away. And I was very clear in this and they didn't do it. Therefore, it's not my fault, it's, it's their fault, right? So, yeah. so, that's, that's where, so that's partly where the lawyer's perspective is going to be. The other part of the lawyer's perspective is going to be, how do we take the ideas you have in your mind and the deal that you have verbally agreed to, and how do we write that into a clear, non-ambiguous contract that makes it clear, you know, who's doing what to whom, when, and why. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think if you're thinking about it, that tells me it is the right time to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But also look at things like, you know, do you have the appropriate insurances that you should have? And I don't know, um, Dan, do you guys bring in someone in the founders, founder fundamentals to cover things like liability insurance? Is that part of the finance person, the finance presentation? We don't have one, someone specifically to cover that. That's definitely something that we can incorporate in one of our, our future uh, sessions. I know in our library, actually, we we have a, a session on that, so you can access that through our Y Space um, YouTube channel. Yeah, I would I would rec if everyone has access to that, I would really recommend you you all do that. Um, is just just to make because basically you're going to have risks in business. Right. So all of these sessions are designed to identify or help you identify the risks to your business. And then it's up to you to put in place mitigation for those risks, right? Like, can you eliminate the risk? Can you reduce the risk? Um, do you have protections in place in case the risk does turn into a reality? Or do you just accept the risk and say, you know what, if I'm going to be in this industry, that's a risk I just have to face and my business can face it. Mm -hmm. Right, that's sort of the common theme, no matter what business you are in, and that applies to me as well. Right? Do I like? Um, there are certain kinds of work I don't want to do. I think it's too risky, so I just don't. I just don't do that kind of business. I, I, I prefer to sleep better at night. So to answer your question, Tamara, yes, I think it sounds like you already have a good idea of what you want to have in those contracts, mm -hmm. and that would be a good starting point. Okay. But yeah, I think it sounds like, you know, and, and the nice thing that you can have is you want to have one that you can hopefully use again and again and again, but also yes. it yes. becomes your own touch point. It becomes your own, okay, I know my contract covers these 15 topics they want me to use their contract. Um, so let me go through their contract and see if they cover the same 15 topics. And do they cover those same 15 topics in the same way that my, my standard template covers it? If they've added something new, can I live with it? Or if they have taken something out that I need, why is that? So for example, for all of you, you all will want limit to liability in your contract, but there's two kinds of limit to liability I always look for. One is a cap on the dollar value, okay? The other thing I look for is the cap on the kinds of liability. And I find a lot of customers will put one of those in their contract but not the other one. 
And so you want to be in a place where you can read the contract and you can say, oh, I see what they did here. They put in the limit on liability that benefits the customer, but they didn't put in the limit of liability that benefits me as a supplier. And I know that, and I'm going to ask for it. Okay. Great um, question. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully that answered your question. And I, I see a couple more. Um, first one is from Jeff in the chat. Um, is there somewhere that we can find a list of all the documents needed for the incorporation of an organization? Um, do you mean the organizational document, like the resolutions and all of that? Um, yeah, yes, that's what I was asking for. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm find not, it in the in the actual act itself, or I think the actual act will just tell you you should do these things, but it doesn't necessarily lay them out. Or if it lays them out, it's across like three hundred pages. Um, I'm not familiar. I mean, I, I wrote a blog where I talk about the different documents, but the templates are not attached. Um, I know there are some web services um, that say they will incorporate your company and do the organizational uh, documents for a fee. Um, but I'm not, I'm just thinking, I spent, I spent hours looking at websites like that, and I never know whether it's applicable to Ontario or Canada or. Yeah, I'm just trying to think. Um, I mean, I have a book, but that's for not for profits. And like, do you really want to spend two or three hundred dollars on a legal like a, like a lawyer's textbook? Um, I, 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 don't, I can't vouch for any of these third party um, legal tech companies that say they do these things because I have not used them. Um, but I think it's a great idea to sort of put a list together. And let me take that offline with Diana about even just coming up with the list of the documents so that you know what to look for or you know what to ask people for. Thank you. Yeah, and just going off of that, I know that Cindy had a question in the chat. Uh, she, was at, she was wondering, are there recommended boilerplate templates that we can look at um, that, would, that would sort of help with all of this? Uh, I mean, it's, that's basically the same question Jeff asked. Um, the, the problem with boilerplate is again, do they fit your jurisdiction? So you could be in Ontario, right? Are you, but are you an Ontario corporated company? Um, and does it cover off what you need it to cover off? So for example, a template could say, um, like, like let's say intellectual property, because that's often one of these. A template could say that the customer owns all of your intellectual property if the template is written to benefit the customer. If the template is written to benefit the supplier, it'll say something totally different. And so you would need some confidence that the template that you're looking at is applicable to you. So even if someone gives you a template, you would still need to, you know, do an assessment to see, does, is this what, is this applicable to my business? Like, is this applicable to an Ontario company? And is it covering off the topics that I need? So it's, it's, it, you're going to find it difficult to get a template only because it might not, it might not, like they're really meant to be custom, customized to your business. Um, I'm trying to think of, I mean, I've seen, I've seen these websites that say, you know, pay 20 bucks and we'll give you a contract, but I don't know what kind of quality control there is about making it applicable for you. So at a minimum, you'd want to read through them to, again, to make sure you understand them. 
So, I mean, I, I, I mean, if I, if I, I think it's worthwhile to work with someone who can help you come up with um, standard terms and conditions for your business. And then you can go off and use and reuse that document again and again and again. But I mean, I, I know, um, I, and, and you should ask your, your lawyers this. I, I had a client who asked me for a services agreement that he was selling uh, training to universities and a non-disclosure agreement. And I knew he wasn't going to come back to me each time he had a deal. So when I wrote these for him, I put a lot of, I annotated it. I said, okay, in this situation, you need this. But if they're saying this other thing, you can take it out. Like I tried to kind of give it to him almost with like a manual to say, here's what these things mean. And here's a common thing the other side uh, might push back on. That way he could take the documents and hopefully use them successfully at different times. And he only comes back to me if there's like a, like a really unique question. So if you're working with people who are giving you templates, that's something I would ask for is can they annotate them for you? Great, thank you so much, Amy. I think that's all the time we have for our questions. Uh, but Amy, I really wanna thank you for, for dedicating your time tonight and, and talking all about the different legal aspects. I know there, there were tons of questions and, and lots, of, lots of different scenarios that we can possibly go through. Um, but I know definitely reading, reading through the contracts, making sure you're thinking about all of the different possibilities and scenarios. Um, it is really important because I've seen many cases where people have run into very um, bad problems after for, for not um, really identifying the specifics of certain things or not thinking about certain things. So thank you so much for bringing that um, to everyone's attention. Really, really appreciate your time tonight. Oh, it's, um, it was my pleasure. And I, and I, you know, I'm not trying to send you guys to bed and thinking, oh, my God, I can't sleep now. Like, I'm going to get sued right? Like, obviously, you have to plan your business according to where you are. And so at a minimum, I would say, create for yourself the checklist of the business terms that you need. And then the legal terms or make it or make it one document, just so that for yourself, when you're reading a contract, you know, you know what you're expecting to find. And then if it's not there, you can ask about it or and, it's, and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to negotiate. The worst that the other side can do is say no. But why would they say no? Because they want to buy your services. They want to buy your products. They want to be in a long term relationship with you. And so sometimes when you negotiate with them, you would just have to say things like, you know what, I'd love to do business with you. but this clause or this part of the contract doesn't fit with my business model. And like, we wouldn't be able to stay in business if, if everyone asked us for this. So can we find a way to, uh, to make this more um, um, like neutral or can we find a way to make this successful for both of our businesses, right? They're not doing you a favor by buying with you, right? You're like a worthy partner to them. They see value in what you are providing to them. So they don't want you going out of business either. Uh, definitely some really, really great points. And, and just a reminder to everyone that we will be sending out the, the slides as well um, to all of you as a resource. So you have that um, for your reference and we will be sending out, I know we had one question. Um, so we'll be sending out the answer to that, that one question out to everyone when, once we confirm um, that we have the information that's correct. Thank you all for attending and we hope to see you again next week. Take care. Bye.